go. <clears throat> so this is a, um, a little webinar about two different subjects. Um, and let me, let me bring up the slide deck. So we're going to talk about um, having real teams and then making, um, making the sprint planning, being, sprint planning meetings uh, better. So those two topics, uh, they're somewhat related, but they're also somewhat distinguishable. Um, so from my point of view, they're almost completely different topics. Okay, so those are the two topics, developing a real team uh, and, and then having a better sprint planning meeting. So I'll make some suggestions on each. We'll have a little discussion. Um, some of you may be more interested in one and, and less interested in the other or, or, uh, or whatever, that's, that's fine. And please, we want your questions, we want your discussion uh, along the way. I guess I'll move this down so I can look at you, all your pictures up here at the top. Um, now I can see you better. Okay, so the, the first one, the real teams. So, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit and then we'll have a discussion. <clears throat> so what do I mean by a real team? What does that really mean? So to me, it means they're, they're on the way to becoming a great team, or at least they have the, the chance, the potential, the, they've gotten a good start towards becoming a great team. Okay, a great team to me is in the five to uh, 10 times uh, increase in the productivity and the, the productivity baseline, but, and more, we're about to get into it. But, but that's the key distinguishing characteristic. And a, and a real team is on the way, they're doing something that's impressive, something that uh, surprises them, uh, and they're coming together, as we say, as a team. They're, some uh, uh, DD, we use the phrase, they're gelling. Uh, but they're coming together as a real team and they're proud of it. Um, so they impress themselves. Um, so, so how do we make that happen? So my first suggestion is, let's make it a goal. We wanna become a real team. And then we've gotta define the goal, but at least we have it as a goal. Uh, and not only the team itself, but maybe the people around the team. We're trying to get there as, as this picture seems to be implying. Um, then we need to, 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 to define what it means to be a real team in some relatively concrete ways. Here are some suggested ways. They're not the only ways by any means. Uh, but, uh, but to me, essential would be having seven people on the team. Um, pretty darn important, not, not 10, not three. I think you're gonna do better with the number closer to seven, that we wanna double the velocity in six months of this team from their baseline, which may take a couple of sprints to know what their baseline is, that we wanna have higher happiness, higher fun in the team. And there's a happiness metric that Jeff Sullen does that can help you figure out how to measure that for your team if you're, if you're going there. Uh, that we want higher quality than we've ever had before. Um, uh, we, we're not going to consider, for example, uh, we're not going to consider stories to be done until all the bugs are fixed and really all the bugs for the whole, uh, up, up to now from wherever. Uh, we're going to be working fewer hours. So this is, this is rather essential, I think. Most of them, when they hear higher velocity, they hear doubling the velocity, they're going to expect that you're going to work me harder. That's what you're really going to do. You're just going to work me harder, maybe work on the weekends, maybe work 12 hours a day. That's how you're going to double the velocity. <clears throat> and, and what we really mean is the classic phrase, we're gonna work smarter, not harder. So that's, that's to me rather important. Then we wanna have more business value per story point. Um, from, from the point of view of the product owner, maybe there's a more aggressive uh, um, goal than just more business value per story point than we used to have. But from the team's point of view, I think that's, uh, that's kind of good enough. You might wanna say how much more. Uh, and then at the end, they say, I never want to leave the team. I never want to leave this team. This is the best six months of my career ever. Don't make me leave. Um, so that's kind of, at least that's a recommended definition for it. I think they have to be inspired. So we have to, to, to become a real team, to really come together. They have to f all feel, uh, DD, that, that only that they have to work together, really become a team in order to accomplish the mission. And so they want to accomplish the, minute, the mission. And I think the, the, the or, or goal, product, whatever, uh, care about the customers, whichever way you want to put it. Um, if, if they don't have this infor, uh, inspiration, why bother to become a good team or a real team or a great team? There's no point in it, right? Now, who has to inspire them? To me, the, the main person, not the only person, is the product owner. Um, 
So when the managers set up the team, they have to have this goal that we want it to be a real team. And I think one of the key words that they don't talk enough about, uh, you, uh, Kathy, you got that? Uh, that? They don't talk enough about is chemistry. So yeah, you could argue about that, but that's what I think. I mean, I don't mean total kumbaya, everybody loves everybody, but that there's a basic chemistry uh, in the team and that it sort of works that way. Uh, so they've got to be good. They, the managers, have to be good at trying to assess the chemistry. Um, so I'll go a step further. Then I want, I re recommend that you ask the team. First of all, do they want to be a real team? Uh, and then uh, with, I mean, not just sort of hypothetically, but with the people that are there in that team, do they, do the, they together want to be a real team um, and accomplish this mission? And do they feel they've been set up for success? I mean, one obvious thing is, do they have the right skill sets, but, but uh, do they have the right chemistry? Uh, but other things, maybe, uh, maybe other things around the team or other impediments or whatever are going to be seriously impeding the team um, in possibly quite a notable way. It does happen. Uh, and so they, I mean, this is not that they're, we're expecting them everything to be perfect. We're going to have impediments. There's no question about it. There's always going to be opportunities for improvement. But do we have, are we really being set up for success or are we being set up, as you, as you might say, for failure? And I do think some teams are more or less set up for failure. Um, so we ask the team and, and hopefully they're saying yes to both these things. Now we got to make it happen. So who's going to make it happen? To me, the scrum master is the first person you think of, uh, helping them become a real team uh, in terms of making it happen. Then the team itself, and I think also the managers around the team. Uh, I guess I should say not just the team, which is often interpreted as the doers, the five doers, but the scrum team, the whole team working together, but also the managers. <clears throat> uh, and they all need to work together, as we might say, right? They are the, I use the, uh, the rowing metaphor with the oars. I was uh, hoping, uh, Eric, for a picture with multiple oars, like eight people in a in a skull or whatever they call it, uh, if you've done that kind of thing. Uh, my, my, one of my daughters uh, was into rowing for a while in college. Uh, and Tai Chi Ono uses the rowing metaphor. So in a similar way, they all have to, as you might say, row together. Um, and a lot of that is fixing impediments, um, little bit by little bit, right? Sprint by sprint. Okay, and then I think you've got to track it uh, and see that the numbers are showing you what you want. And not only the numbers about velocity, but also the numbers about happiness, for example. Um, so no, no, uh, not, a, not, a, not so much different than you might expect. So, uh, one quote that, that was semi related that I found was scrum is not magic. Um, so becoming a real team, becoming a great team might seem like magic, but it's really not magic that you have to sort of, well, it is magic too. That's the only other thing, Shelley. It's also magic, but anyway, human beings are magic. So, uh, each team is its own. Here's the quote by Grant Hill. So you get his idea about Coach K, about coaching different teams, and that each year, if you know basketball, I'm into Duke basketball. My brother's, my brother went there. He's very much into it. Uh, my daughter went to Chapel Hill, so I'm I'm uh, I'm torn apart. If if you know no. Um, but anyway, you have to coach each team differently to become a real team, to become a great team. Uh, I think that's quite true. And, and then uh, I won't go into the reality so much, but um, you know, there's a lot of things to work through. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not trying to say that this is going to be easy, but I think it's worthwhile. I think it can be done. Um, uh, a little bit more about chemistry. I'm not going to go there. We want to have time for the discussions and so forth. Um, and then uh, I do like this IDEO. I don't know if you know about IDEO. Um, I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, they may pronounce it a little bit differently. Uh, but back in 2001, uh, their, their general manager, I guess the, the, the top guy, got some people together and they came up with these six uh, things that define, at least define for them, hot teams. Um, so this dedication or this commitment by the team um, that they actually, I didn't say this, but they say it, they, they need a slightly ridiculous deadline, which I, which I find amusing, that phrasing. Um, they need to be irreverent and non-hierarchical. Um, I might well have said that. I, I do agree with that for sure. Uh, the team needs to be well-rounded and respectful of its diversity. 
uh, well rounded maybe uh, uh, DD they mean uh, you know the the an appropriate set of skill sets uh, within the team uh, I'm not sure exactly what he means by well well rounded um, uh, they they really like the space uh, the open eclectic space uh, and they want to enhance the flexibility of the team the the group the group working together uh, the different people working together in the brainstorming uh, and they they are empowered to go get whatever it takes to to uh, to get it done. That's a key phrase in Scrum. Whatever it takes. Uh, anyway, so I wanted to emphasize that a little bit. Okay, so so who's who's got questions or discussion about this topic? Maybe maybe those ideas helped that I said, but whether they did or not, um, what are your thoughts at this point? Your your comments. Your... And this is Judy. Yes, please. Hi, Judy. You mentioned the happiness metric and you mentioned someone who had. Yeah, the, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff Sutherland. I'm sorry, the last name? Sutherland, at, no. uh, at, yeah, the, the co-creator Scrum. Got it, thank you. Sutherland, L-A-N-D. I have uh, family friends that are Sutherland, L-I-N. So this is Sutherland, S-U-T-H-E-R-L-A-N-D. Um, so he's got a couple of blog posts about that, Judy, uh, and how he likes to do it. It's not very complicated. Um, I found in some organizations too, you mentioned that line about the team was irreverent and non-hierarchical. Yes, easy for me to say, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I had trouble getting my tongue around that one, but go ahead. I found sometimes it takes a bit of effort to um, keep that from sort of clashing in with some corporate cultures. Oh yes, well. That don't necessarily foster that or value it. Yep. or see how it contributes to the success. Do you have any, any thoughts or suggestions, ideas on that? Well, I'm pretty sure it's not that I first, saw it in a vacuum. The first idea at the beginning is get a big curtain and hide, hide the team behind the curtain and tell everybody, don't pay no attention to the people, folks behind the curtain and leave us alone and, and we'll just be ourselves behind the curtain, so to speak. So that's one, uh, one idea, at least for a little while. Another idea is once you be, start to become successful, you tell them, this is the way we do it. Um, and, and you gotta learn to leave us alone. Uh, so, so sometimes it will help to get a manager, you know, I'll say the right manager, but to get a manager to come in and say, uh, you know, we're, I agree with you all, or some of you, that, that we're a hierarchical culture and we've been doing things by power and so forth. Um, but that's the past. What we want to become is something different. Now, obviously that requires you to go find that person, uh, Judy, and convince them to make that speech or have that discussion. Um, uh, but often the culture has been that way, but the culture, or at least some people in the culture, at least some people in the culture are willing to consider changing it. And so you've got to get them to, to be willing to, 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 to talk about it because some people won't let go of it until it's, at least it's discussed that the managers would like it to go that way. Um, any other any other thoughts, Eric? How would yeah, you mine is more about a discussion on. Well, hold on, hold on. Are, how would you help Judy with her question? Ah, no, this is more about a discussion on being a great team now in midst of pandemic that everyone oh, okay. is no longer co-located. Yes, it's hard to um, communicate or be, um, build trust in Zoom meetings like yes. this. It is and, harder, I think. Yeah, so I guess we, we need to refocus more on the relationship between the trust of its, each one of the participants in a team. Yes, and... Yeah. and um, it actually adds to your comment about non-hierarchical, because when you do that, you don't really look at levels. You yeah, that, well, somewhere. right now, everybody's flat, so to speak. Yeah. Um, yes, yes, indeed. So um, I, I would just wanted to add this about, about working in Zoom meetings, which is, that you've got to go out of your way to be more personal than usual. Uh, you've got to go out of your way to care about the lighting, to to be kind to the people that are with you in the meeting, so to speak, and, and get a good speak, get a good uh, microphone, or and or a good speaker, so you can hear them better. Get a little bit better lighting. Work on the well. Mine is a virtual background, but make your background look good, and then you can talk about what good what does good mean. Um, be be yourself more real. And take time just to be personal in a way that naturally happens that you know when you're in the office by the water cooler or whatever the equivalent is that kind of all that personal stuff kind of happens but in the zoom meetings it doesn't happen as naturally so you've got to go out of your way to try to make it happen anyway i wanted to say those couple of things 
Um, I've got a whole little um, mural chart. I wasn't going to use mural today, uh, but maybe we, maybe I'll make it a, a f future session, Eric, where we talk about working remotely. And I'll show the mural chart that has a bunch of different people's ideas about how to do that more effectively. I do think it's harder. I mean, uh, real experts say that that working for very long in a mural meeting with a bunch of faces staring at you is is very tiring. Most people can't do it, but for a few hours a day. So it's a key issue. Um, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it it does make it harder. I think it definitely does make it harder. Um, okay, other other thoughts, other thoughts, questions. There's some other folks over the uh, beside. Well, to me, DD, beside you, uh, uh, Shorna is there. Any thoughts, questions, Shorna? Mohammed? Nope. We got Judy. Eric, did you? Yeah, have What's Shorna? Joe, this is Didi. I did have one question. Um, you said it was the product owner's responsibility to inspire. Yes. And it's up to the scrum master, the team, and the manager to make it happen. Can you kind of contrast those two positions in terms of what they need to provide for team support, the product owner and the scrum master? Yes, yes. Okay, so, so I, don't, I don't feel like it's totally on the, on the product owner, but m at least within the team, mainly on the product owner, to help them understand the mission, the, the goal, the, the, you know, how wonderful the product's going to be but also to, to try to understand the people and express it in a way that's inspiring to them. And maybe to help evaluate, I mean, the Scrum Master can help evaluate also, but help evaluate, are they indeed inspired? Or do we have one or two people on the team that are just, you know, they're not that into it. Um, and they may be quite good or quite appropriate from a skill set point of view, but if they're not into it, they're probably gonna bring the morale, morale of the team down. I mean, they're not gonna, they aren't necessarily gonna try to bring the morale down, but they're not gonna, they're not going to support the morale of the team. They're not going to, they're not excited about this stuff. So let them go to a different team and be excited about that work. Um, so anyway, it's, it's a, it's, it's a bunch of little things of, of explaining it, getting to know the people and explaining it in a way that's, that's inspiring to that person. Each person is different. Um, and then helping evaluate, um, are they indeed inspired or are they just saying so or whatever? Uh, and then re-inspiring them. Um, no, I don't want to say continuously, but you know what I mean. Every, every couple of sprints, they've got to come back and talk about it again. People lose track of why they're really here and why they really want to do this. So you've got to come back and, and re-inspire them. Uh, you could say that about a lot of things. You could say, about, about, say that about a football team that's, that won the Super Bowl last year, right? I don't know how the Kansas City Chiefs are doing, um, but you know what I mean. They won the Super Bowl last year. How can it be the same energy level? to come back and do it again, right? For some teams, maybe they do, they can. It's, it's hard to do, as you may know in the NFL. But whatever sport, same thing for us, right? We're kind of a sports team. The scrum team is kind of a sports team. So you gotta get them re, whatever you wanna call it, energized. Now, the, the other part is not so much inspiring, but rather just making things happen. I'll make it as simplistic, but it isn't really, but as simplistic as just fixing the impediments one after the other. So to me, you've got to get the, you have to get the managers involved. I mean, obviously the scrum master has to be engaged in that, but, but you've got to get the managers involved. And I think that's idea is not as well known as it should be that the managers have to support that and that we uh, have to assume that they're going to be distracted. So we, the managers are going to be distracted. So we, the team, particularly we, the scrum master have to figure out how to pull the managers in to get them to say yes, to help us with at least some of the impediments. I don't, does that help, DD? A little bit? Okay. I mean, that's, that's the, at least the simple version of what I meant. Uh, okay, Shelly, you've, you've got a real team already. So, so this was easy for you. I'm, being, I'm, being, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm stating it as if it were a fact, but I'm kind of asking it as a question. So uh, uh, I... I we don't treat it like a team that wants to win the Super Bowl. We should treat it that way. Or whatever, you know, the, the championship of whatever sport. If you're going to play in a league, you want to win. Um, and it isn't just about competition, but they should have the, I don't know, how, do you, how would you express it, Shelly? The fire in the belly. 
Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Right, you want them to be energized. Yeah, they 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 feel like they got to do this. Uh, it's not really an option. Uh, and I don't know that we that we um, think that way. You know, we just think of well, we got to get all this work done again with, with an impossible deadline again uh, with a lot of confusion and unclear requirements again. Well, there are folks that um, you know they claim that they're not there to be energized or really love their job. They they just are there for a paycheck. Yes. Oh, oh, well, okay then. So, uh, I, I don't agree with that. That's not, first of all, that's not a way for them to live. But secondly, that's not a way to have a great team. It's not a way for the company to be really successful. If the, if your competition has a great team or even a real team and you've got a team that's just there collecting a paycheck, it's pretty obvious. I think who's going to win. I mean, it's just, it's just, obvious. but it's also not good for them. Yeah, I agree oh. with you, Joe. I have teams like that. I either have to talk to a resource manager to replace him. Yeah. I'm not working in a team where in, not everyone's in equal um, collaborative space. But at the same time, I want to say, some people are very low key. And they actually are, you know, they have a lot of energy behind it, but they're going to express it in a very low key way. I think that's true for a lot of our people. So just because they don't, you know, stand up and scream or something like that doesn't mean that they're not engaged and not working hard and don't care. So you, so you've got to ask them, you know, do you, do you really, are you really interested in this work? Do you really want to see it get done? Uh, if not, we can, you know, let's see if we can get you on another team that where, you, where you'd find the work much more interesting, much more compelling. Uh, and I think, Joe, that everybody, while they might be motivated to accomplish the same goal, they're going to be motivated by slightly different things. Yes, absolutely. I think that's absolutely. You might, you might have folks. You can, you can try to get them invigorated by building on that subtext, you know, yeah. that secondary motivation of I just want to get a paycheck or the secondary motivation of helping them understand the impact that this product will have in a larger environment in the client base or whatever. That might be something that speaks to them yes. in, a, in a deeper manner than – whatever the goal is that's been set for the team. Well, I think you have to keep your eyes on that. You also have to try to figure out at the individual level, if you can find a way to sort of get everybody marching in step, even though they might be marching to different drummers. Well, I think they are going to be marching to different drummers, but I, but I want to come back. So this, there's this book uh, drive by Daniel Pink that you've, you've know, you know of it, Judy, right? So you remember the three things that he says, right? Well, the first thing he says is any kind of extrinsic motivation like money is not going to lead to good success in terms of uh, getting work done. It, I mean, they may do a bunch of stuff, but they're not going to care about the quality or, or things of that nature. So extrinsic motivations are generally negative, not just sort of neutral, but negative. And a lot of us believe that these extrinsic things like a uh, higher, you know, pay raise or something like that. Uh, it's, it's a lot of us commonly think that that's the way to, to motivate people. You know, I'll give, we'll give you a bonus if you make this date or something like that. Well, he brings up the hierarchical <laughs> stuff too, titles. Yes, that too, that as well. Like that. So, uh, so I would recommend, uh, you know, all of y'all, if you have the problem with this motivation, reread that book and think about it and maybe even have them read it. I don't know. Maybe I'm a motivation geek or whatever. I found that book very interesting, very compelling and not very, not very long. And I read the whole damn thing which surprises me. I don't read whole books anymore. Um, so get, uh, so read it yourself and then have them read it and then talk to them about uh, more about motivation. I think they're going to have a better life if they start to appreciate that that's important uh, and that that's possible where, where you are. Um, so you may have to work with a manager and say, you know, if, if you don't like this work, we can get you, we, we, you know, we got two other projects over here. You could work on those and we could swap, swap some people around. Um, but it's a, it's a key issue. Uh, did you, did you have a quick comment, uh, Catherine? Um, I don't have that problem in my teams. I, because we're a bunch of uh, consultants so, that's on a contract or F SOW. So, um, so we're all, you know, uh, it's ultra competitive, so they could renew our contract. Ah, um, yeah. but I think that, um, because of, you know, I think uh, someone mentioned, you know, because this we're living in a new world and uh, this is, uh, and everyone is distributed. Um, I think that uh, right. we do have to make an extra effort 
um, to reach out to our teammates on uh, to uh, you know, uh, uh, to make sure that we're meeting our deliverables and making sure that uh, we're working together on our work efforts so we could complete it within the sprint. Yes. Um, so that's an extra effort because we're not together in the same room anymore. Yes, and yes, indeed. Um, so making those things, the, 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 the sprint backlog, for example, visible, or making the cards visible in some fashion uh, every day with the whole team and having them appreciate that uh, I think could help a, help a bunch. I mean, that's not the only way, but I, I just wanted to mention those ways. You made me think of that. Um, okay, uh, okay. So any other thoughts on this subject uh, of the real team? I think, that's, I think it's awfully important and, and not given enough discussion, not given enough uh, effort. Uh, okay, so let's look at the other one, the more, to me, more straightforward one, which is how to have a better sprint planning meeting. Um, so I'm, a, I'm kind of assuming that you know, but maybe you don't, so let's review it. Maybe not all of you do. This, this, uh, this scrum dynamic model that Jeff Sullivan has. Um, and maybe you don't know it as that, you know it in a different way. So you know it maybe as the ready, ready criteria or as the definition of ready and the whole definition of ready process. Um, but the basic idea of this, of this picture is that we kind of know the value ahead of time that's kind of instantiated in the product backlog, you might say. I'm simplifying going quickly. But the key idea is that as, let's say eight stories go into the sprint, eight or more stories go into the sprint, we need to make sure that those stories are ready, ready before they go into the sprint. We're not allowing crapola into our sprints anymore, right? That's the key idea, right, Mohammed? Uh, we're not allowing crapola into our sprints. We're gonna have good, well-defined stories that the, the implementers, Judy, feel like they understand and then they're set up for success and all they gotta do is do it. Boom, boom, boom. They don't have the unclear requirements anymore where they're going around guessing what the customer wants. Just guessing uh, based on some high level information, but otherwise they're guessing. So, uh, and related to that, Shelly, is the idea that the team, the five doers can reject any story where they think the information, the details are insufficient. Now, all these details don't have to be written down, but uh, so to speak, you might say all the questions that the, that the doers, that the five implementers have, have been answered, both the coders and the testers, if it's software, we use those terms. Uh, so they get to reject any stories that don't have sufficient information, and they get to ask for a little bit more information if the product owner who's bringing, so to speak, is responsible for bringing the information, um, doesn't have all the, all the information. Now, this also, to me, implies, Catherine, that the product owner has a good process with, I'll call it minions, other people helping him or her as the product owner, uh, has a good process for developing these details on a regular flow kind of basis. Um, and that these people are the people that are helping the product owner and or the product owner themselves, but usually, well, both, usually both, the product owner and others are developing these details. And they're good and the product owner reviews it and is always making it a little bit better, a little bit better, but it's a pretty good process. Which may take several sprints to, you know, if you're with a brand new client, Catherine, it might take several sprints to get that to be going, right? A lot of clients just want to at least, I used to be a consultant, they used to want to, you know, wipe their hands, you just, you, you guys go do it. And of course, if the client doesn't participate, uh, we'll, at least my thought was, we as, you know, as consultants could do things, but really we need all the details that only they know. So they've got to participate in a, an appropriate way. And then exactly how that is can be a lot of different specific ways. Anyway, whether, whatever kind of situation you're in, you've got a good flow of details coming in each sprint and they're ready, ready, so to speak, before the sprint starts. We remove the impediments. Then the other side of the thing is, is pretty well known, right? The definition of done and every story has to be done, 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 uh, at the end of the sprint, right? And everything's gotta be checked off. All the bugs are fixed and so forth. Uh, and then we know our velocity. Now, if the ready, ready is good and the done, done is good, then our velocity is going to go up. Okay, so that, but the main thing I'm talking about right now is the, is the ready, ready to have a, because the sprint planning meeting is the next step after that ready, ready process. Um, okay, so we've got a ready, ready process that precedes the sprint planning meeting. The team has voted up, to, uh, thumbs up for all the stories that are coming in. Uh, or at least sufficiently thumbs up. In other words, they might have gone sideways and said, I've got one more quick question. But otherwise, they consider the story good enough as long as that question gets answered. And the product owner's got enough time to answer that question. Um, 
the team has reviewed the story points and is happy with the story points beforehand and has revised the story points if necessary. Uh, and the user stories are already small, that is to say the right size for a sprint, and all about equal in size. I'm kind of assuming all of that. To me, those are uh, 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 prerequisites, so to speak, for a good sprint planning meeting. Uh, also, in addition, the, the uh, well, we talked about this, the product owner has a decent process or flow for getting the, the details together. So we had just enough information just in time. We don't give them any excess information that they don't need that they already have in their heads. We only give them, or particularly only write down what they need to have written down. And we have good business stakeholders that, you know, these sort of three things are basic, right? They come regularly to the sprint planning meeting. They are pretty good. For example, I mean, specifically for the sprint review, they give pretty accurate feedback about what the customer's gonna want. But similarly, they can anticipate and review these documents or this documentation or these comments and make further comments about it in a pretty good way. I mean, there may be differences of opinion, but in a pretty good way. And they have enough time to participate with us. Uh, and I find all three conditions are hard to satisfy sometimes, Judy. It wouldn't surprise me if each and every one of you had had problems getting good business stakeholders by that you know, three-part definition. Um, so, but, but anyway, I'm kind of assuming that that's already been done because that's, a, again, a prerequisite in a certain way to having a good meeting, having the right people. Uh, okay, so I'm about to do a drawing of what I think the meeting should look, look like, but here are some key things. We want to include the, the scrum team and at least for the first part, the business stakeholders. We want to identify a sprint goal. We want to pull the stories in. That is to say they're volunteering for the stories. We want to ask the business stakeholders or, or more you might say, tell them, speak now or forever hold your peace. I'll explain what that means in a minute probably a new phrase for you. Uh, we want to get a tentative, tentative commitment at the story level. Then we want to you know, build out the tasks in the sprint planning meeting uh, collectively, the, particularly the five doers, right? They're building out the tasks and they get to comment and improve each other's tasks. Then with the tasks and the stories or the stories and the tasks, they then commit to getting this work done in a, I'll call it Shelley, a two week period, whatever the sprint length is, right? but the eight stories assumes sort of a two week period. They commit, and you're not gonna believe this, Mohammed, but once they commit, they actually are mostly, not always, reliable in getting it done. So they, sh they, they, uh, they start to act like adults, Catherine. When they commit to something, they actually get it, as we sometimes say, freaking done, whatever freaking means. Um, and then uh, we're more likely to hit the project timelines, aren't we? Uh, Catherine, if they can get each sprint done pretty reliably. Then if we have a little bit of a reasonable amount of contingency, then we're going to get it done on time and within budget, and then it's a successful project overall. Um, so this, this ability to commit in a reliable way, not overcommit, Shelley, but to commit in a, re, in a way that you can turn out to be reliable, pretty important. Okay, so let's start to draw that. Now I've got to unshare this. Uh, and I don't know, maybe you've seen it. Oh, I'm not sharing yet. And then I go to this. Okay, so, so we've got the, the 11 people there, at least at the beginning. Part one is the stories, right? So we want, Joe wants eight. And do trois, quatre, cinq, six, sept, huit, eight. And they're all coming from the product backlog, right? From the top of the product backlog. Uh, and the product owner has got the right ones coming in terms of everything, but mainly in terms of ROI. And they're being pulled in, right, DD? They're being pulled in by the doers, not being pushed in by the product owner. The doers are saying, oh, we can do this one. We can do this one. We can do this one. And that's eight of them. And we know that our velocity is 20. And so guess what? Unless there's a good reason, these two adds up these stories add up to about 20 story points. So 20 is 20. We don't go higher, Eric, unless we've got a good reason to. Like everybody's here this sprint and they weren't for the last three sprints or, or the scrum master just fixed an, an impediment that should enable us to get, then go uh, uh, at the level of 21, let's say, story points. So they've got a good, it could be lower also, right? If there's a good reason, but it could be upper, higher or lower if there's a good reason. Um, so they, and then the product owner, puts all the details out on the table, so to speak, and says, uh, any discussion about the details of these stories? And then particularly, after putting them all out on the table, metaphorically at least, 
uh, obviously, Eric, if we're remote, it's going to be a metaphorical putting everything on the table. Um, but then the project owner can ask the, the um, business stakeholders, speak now or forever you'll hold your peace. Is there anything in all these details that you want to amplify, emphasize, change, or add to? Is there anything different that you want to, because you got to tell us now. If you don't tell us now, we're going to go ahead and build this stuff, and then it's not going to be what you want. And then we got to, you know, so to speak, erase all that and then rebuild it in the next sprint. Speak now or forever hold your peace. It's so much better to tell us now. Uh, okay, so they, of course, they at first, Shelly, they look at you like, what? I've never put, been put under pressure like this before. So if you're the product owner, you got to tell them, this is what I'm going to say. Don't be surprised. Get, you know, you better read the, you better read all these details. Otherwise, when I ask a question, you're going to go, uh, I don't know what they say. That's not going to be very helpful. So get your, either you or some of your folks, read all these details, make sure you're happy with them. Never had to do that before. Uh, okay, so they, then you say speak now and then they say, well, they say whatever they say. The first time DD, they don't usually say as enough. Later, when they make comments later, we say, well, why didn't you say that in the sprint planning meeting? They go, uh, 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 didn't think of it. Yeah, exactly, you didn't even try to think of it. So they start to see where they miscommunicated DD, right? When they get to the sprint planning meeting, they realize every one of these things, basically a miscommunication. We didn't, we failed to explain what we really, really wanted. Um, okay, so we do that. That should happen pretty quickly because it's already been discussed, right? In the so-called, uh, uh, whatever you want to call them, pre-planning meetings, sometimes they're called. Sometimes we call them product backlog refinement meetings, uh, whatever, whatever we call them. Okay, so then the business stakeholders take off. Then we have part two, the tasks. So I at least want the task to be very small, two hour tasks, right? So that's the size of the task. By the way, this is for a two week sprint. This is four hours total. So this would be actually less than one hour probably. And this would be the other three hours, right? Uh, okay, so they, how many tasks are they gonna have, Shelly? Uh, a bunch, right? It's gonna be five doers in my simple example, right? So 50 to 100 tasks. I'm not gonna be too picky right now about that, but a good number of tasks. So we're breaking this down at a much lower level of detail. Why two hours? Why is two hours useful, Eric? Does it make sense to you? Is it obvious? It may not be. Some, for some of us, maybe more than that. Because I, like I bring in the product analyst or the BA to actually key them in right in JIRA as ah, a final okay. commitment. Yes, yes, okay. In my yeah. sprint planning meeting. For the two I'm hours, not... because I, I want them to break down their, I'm assuming they're full-time dedicated to this project, right? Yeah. So in the next day, they have maximum. I mean, if everything is a sunny day, maximum they can get six hours worth of work done. So we break it down into two piece, three pieces. So in the beginning of the, of the morning, in the daily stand-up, they say, I'm going to get this done, I'm going to get this done, and I'm going to start working on this. And then the next morning, if things go well, I got this done, I got this done, and I got started on this. So that, and that gives enough transparency for everybody to see clearly, Catherine, whether we're making progress or not. And are we making enough progress to get this sprint done successfully? And they can see it clearly. And um, well, Catherine, have you ever known any guys who won't ask for help? Uh, yes, I, um, team members and uh, oh, I'm, well, not, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not. dealing with a lot of the um, thought leaders and directors and, you know, they commit to a lot of these, you know, uh, work efforts, um, but it's hard to get their time because yes, yes, they yes. have their other uh, commitments as a high priority as well. Um, yes, yes. That's, yes. A, that's a different issue. But what I was teasing about was me. Uh, I had to drive, I went up to see my niece get married. I had to drive from Richmond back to Charlotte and I wouldn't ask for directions how to get back on the highway. Um, so sometimes guys are known to not ask for enough help. I'll just put it that way. Um, so that's, that's what I wanted to focus on and, and tease, tease myself. Uh, well, what I was saying is that, you know, even though, you know, they make these commitments and, you know, I, I don't actually see the outcome immediately because, yeah, they have so many other priorities yes. that they, they don't know how to ask for help or to delegate. Yes, yes, yes. That's a different issue than I was trying to bring out, but that's a very important issue. I agree. Uh, but this issue is just how do we get them to ask for help? And if they don't get, you know, the, what they said, right, DD, if they don't get this one done and this one done and they didn't get started on this one, 
then anybody can say, why don't I help you, Joe? And Joe doesn't have to ask for help. We can offer help because we can see uh, if the stories are two hours each that the person needs help without going into ridiculous detail, Eric, right? And having five or whatever, six one-hour tasks. That's a little bit harder, a lot more detail, right? So it's a trade-off between doing it relatively quickly with relatively little detail and getting enough detail or getting things small enough that we can see something noticeably off, Shelly, that we go like, ooh, that one needs help. That situation needs help, or that person needs help, perhaps. Uh, okay, so that's, that's why the two hours. You can argue about that, but that's why. And, and maybe a few are a little bit bigger, Eric, and maybe a few are a little bit smaller. I'm not gonna get, you know, uh, whatever you wanna call it, uh, uh, totally picky about the two hour thing. Okay, so they do that. Then everybody looks at everybody else's tasks or all the tasks, and they ask themselves, do we have all the right tasks? Are we missing any tasks? Do we have to, any extra tasks? Are all the tasks described in a way that everybody can understand? Uh, who tends to overestimate their tasks? Let's knock them down. Who tends to underestimate their tasks? Let's add a little, little bit more there. Do we have the right people assigned? Is Eric got too much work? Does uh, Catherine have too little work? Do we have the right work balancing across everybody? At least the best we can figure out as of this moment, not that it won't change, it's gonna change. But as of the moment, let's see if we have pretty good uh, workload balancing and what difference that makes when we start to adjust for that. Uh-oh, we're giving it to people that don't know how to do it as well. That means the efforts uh, estimates are gonna go up. Yowzer, that starts to affect things, right? Sometimes they start to see, we better not commit to eight stories, we better commit to seven stories. They start to see that, right? Okay, so then they do that. Now, part three is they commit to both the stories and the tasks. It's more important they get the stories done, right, DD, than the tasks. Uh, I forgot to mention, up here we gotta have a sprint goal. I don't emphasize that as much as I should. Uh, so I should have put that in the first part, they gotta have a sprint goal. Anyway, they commit to this, both the stories and the tasks, and Shelly, they got to start to become reliable. So here's how to, uh, you, so you all have to define, you and your team have to define reliability, but here's how I define it. You're reliable for one sprint, if and only if you get all eight stories done, or if the stories have to change during the sprint, and particularly if that's common in your situation, which it might be, uh, some of the stories have to change. If that happens, then you got to say, okay, we commit to 20 story points or whatever the number is, the velocity, but let's say it's 20 in this case. We're gonna to commit to 20, so we're only reliable for that one sprint, if and only if we get all 20 story points done. Okay, now over 10 sprints, 0% reliability, DD, is that too low, too high, or just right for across the 10 sprints? That's obviously too low. Uh, Shelly, 100% reliability, is that too low, too high, or just right? Too high. Too, high, too high. Our work is not that predictable. Stuff, as we sometimes say, stuff happens, right? Things blow up in our faces, you might say. So what I'm looking for is their ability to go, and maybe, maybe my numbers won't suit your team, but to get a high level of reliability, I'm gonna call it 70 to 80%, somewhere in that range, over whatever 20, uh, 40 uh, sprints, but roughly 80, 70 or 80 over the first 10 sprints. Now, to be fair, they're likely to fail at being reliable the first three sprints in a row, if we're a brand new team. That would be very common. They, they tend to overcommit, is a very common phenomenon. They tend to have some big problems that they haven't addressed yet. Um, so the first several sprints tend to be unreliable, 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 unreliable. Now, they may have gotten seven stories out of eight, but still, according to my definition, they're only reliable if they get eight out of eight. There's no close, there's no horseshoes kind of thing. There's no, well, we were close. No, you either got it all done or you didn't get it all done. That's reliable. Um, so I think 70 to 80 is where you're, what you're shooting for. And it may take them several sprints before they really got things, you know, cooking, as we might say, where they start to be pretty reliable most sprints. Uh, they start to be reliable most sprints, seven, eight sprints out of 10. Uh, okay, so to me, that's what you're trying to have happen in a good sprint planning meeting. If you begin the sprint well with a good sprint planning meeting, you're likely to be a lot more successful. A little bit different DD than what people are doing, than what, you're, what some of your friends are doing? Okay, so I think um, that, that, that if you do it that way, it's gonna be better for you and better for your team. Oh, oh, I'm a participant, okay.
Uh, okay, so let me go back to this, this keynote thing. Uh, okay, so that's, those are the kind of things from the drawing. And we did the drawing, okay. Okay, so what do you think? What are, what are your thoughts? Or did you want to go a very different direction than what I went, which is fine too. Uh, but what are your thoughts about having a better sprint planning meeting? Or your questions about what I said or whatever. I have a question. Please. So, at any point in the sprint planning meeting, are we having a discussion about um, impediments and the impact of impediments? Yes, I think you have to. That's a okay. good point. Um, and uh, to me, the discussion is, it, well, there's, there's, okay, let's, uh, let's way oversimplify and say that there's two kinds of impediments. They're, they're showstoppers. And if we don't fix those, we're not going to get at least one story done. Uh, often we call them blockers, as you may know. Mm -hmm. um, but they're showstoppers. You know, the whole, the, the servers are going to be down for three, four days in a row. Well, that's kind of pretty, I mean, in terms of a regular sprint, that's going to kill the regular sprint. Um, and then there's the usual stuff that's, or, or other things that are not showstoppers that we can live with. But sometimes they're the, the, the stuff that we can live with, so to speak, one by one by one. But if you add it together, you start to realize you better commit to a much lower velocity than in previous sprints, because these things are going to happen. I don't know. One example might be that the product owner is going to be gone for a week. And so for that one week, getting questions answered will be pretty, well, no, it won't be impossible, but it'll be hard. The, and the answers will come back much more slowly. Um, so yes, you've got to talk about, how, you know, what are your impediments? Is this really realistic given the impediments that we have? And particularly the, you know, the impediments or the issues or whatever you want to call them, the, the specific situation of each of those eight stories or nine or 10 or whatever the number is. Uh, so you've got to talk about that. And you've got to talk about, as you're doing the task, you've got to talk about, well, how are we actually going to build this? Uh, have we, uh, you know, is the architecture going to support it? The current architecture, da, 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 all these kinds of questions should have, either they can come up before or they can come up then, but they should come up your last chance to decommit or to revise your story points, Judy, would be in that sprint planning meeting. So whatever you need to discuss to make a reasonable commitment ought to be discussed. And I think those, the impediments that you're thinking of um, now, um, <coughs> You may know that I like the idea of a, a top 20 impediment list. So it's kind of the notion, I've never actually said it out loud, I don't think, but it's kind of the notion that the important impediments are there and that there are tons more less important impediments that are relatively, at this point, relatively minor because they don't make it to the top 20 list. Um, so, you know, uh, should we discuss uh, impediment 99, impediment 74, impediment 88? Maybe not. Maybe we don't need to discuss those because they're so minor. But, but something that's in the top 20 list and how it affects this work and whether we are able, therefore, to commit to this work, I think that discussion is an important discussion that has to happen. Now, how long? you got to manage the time box, right? We're not gonna I am familiar with um, a team where they wanted to cast the scrum master in the role of a doer and mm -hmm. have the impediments, the resolution of the impediments, turned into tasks, including things that would be stored in the product backlog. Uh, oh, the sprint backlog, you mean? The sprint backlog, I'm sorry. Um, and even in this team, there was conversation around, do we make some of the larger impediments part of the product backlogs because it's a larger issue that yes. might need to be addressed. So is that appropriate, inappropriate in your view? Well, but adding an impediment to the sprint backlog is not only appropriate, but also recommended by the current Scrum Guide. Got it. It's not very clear that it's saying that, I think. Uh, so but go back and read it, I think. You'll notice. There was a little bit of pushback because of the concept of the scrub master not being a, a doer, quote unquote. Um, so are you going to track that sort of thing in JIRA? Yes, it is, it is different. I can appreciate that they feel like it's different. Um, so, so I would, I'm not a, so some people advocate that the scrub master be a part-time implementer and a part-time scrum master. I'm not, the, I'm not really advocating that, at least on a good-sized team like seven. Uh, I'm, I like the idea of a full-time scrum master. But by doer, I think in this context, you mean that they're going to be working on that impediment. Right. They're doing the job of a scrum master, right, and resolving the impediments. So. Yes, yes, yes. So it's, right. they're working on the impediment. Um, and, and I do like the idea that other people may be better at working on a specific impediment, but in one way or the other, they're working on the impediment, and I'm fine to have the task there. 
the implementers might want to distinguish between, so to speak, you know, tasks related to stories, real stories, real PBI, real um, business value ones, so to speak, for the customers versus uh, stories that are not for the customers, which might include working on uh, bugs, which might include working on technical debt, right? They're not the customer features. So you've got these kinds of issues of, do you, do you keep track of sort of, you know, this much velocity went to this and this much velocity went to working on impediments. Uh, so you might want to track those kind of things, but otherwise I'm fine to put it in the sprint backlog. I think it's a good Thank idea. You. I think it's a good idea. Uh, other, other thoughts, questions. What was, what, what would be, what's your favorite idea, Shelley, of making the sprint planning meeting better? Okay, I put you on the spot. Uh, but Catherine's already thought of one. She says, no, not yet. Give me a little, yeah. bit, give me a little bit more time. Oh. Yeah, so I think that is really important to have the product owner there. You, know, yes. uh, you, men, you gave one sample before about uh, the product owner being on vacation before. Um, but it's, it, the same thing happened to us as well. And uh, there was scope creep as soon as he got back. Yes. Uh, he wasn't part of that so sprint planning uh, refinement meeting. Yes. Uh, and, and then re related to that, though, is one of the is a misunderstanding that the product owner gets to uh, tell the team what stories they're going to take on. So the, mm -hmm. one of the key ideas is that the doers are volunteering for the work. Now, there might be also a negotiation, Catherine, right, that they, the doers get down to story five or whatever, and they go like, ooh, we can't do the next story because, because of one, a big impediment that Judy maybe kind of was alluding to. And then if the product owner is there, the product owner says, well, don't worry about that. Do skip that one and do story six and seven, eight and nine. Uh, right. And, and uh, I'm, I'm okay that you therefore reprioritize a little bit. Uh, so right. and if re reprioritization needs to happen, the product owner ought to be there to discuss it at least. I'm sorry, go absolutely ahead. Absolutely, right. He was on vacation. And so when he got back, there was scope creep. And then uh, the scrum master was surprised because we started changing uh, we started adding stories. We started changing the story points um, because of the scope creep. And then the scrum master wasn't involved in those discussions because the product owner didn't involve the other um, team members. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, very good. Uh, I mean, that's a, a good learning, good example that right. uh, the, everybody else can use. Uh, okay, other thoughts, other questions, other things that you want to share? How do you um, get the stakeholders um, to be more involved, uh, yeah. the product owner and the upper management? Yes, it's a, it's a very common problem. So first thing is, you know, you're, you have a lot of company getting, having that problem. Um, I, I think you've basically got to explain to them and their bosses th how important they are and how much things get mucked up if they don't show up and do their job. Um, so you've got to really make it transparent to, to the right people that if they don't show up and do their job well, it's really going to be a mess. We can't be successful. We can't have anything like the success that we could have. Um, and then I th even then they're going to say, well, well, I'd like to help, but uh, busy, you know, that kind of stuff. I've got other things I've got to do, that kind of thing. So it's got to be, they've got to feel the importance of it so much that they realize we've got to deprioritize this other stuff for this person and give this a higher priority so that they're always coming to these meetings. Now, part of it may be working out with them and maybe with others with, in terms of being engaged with the team over the whole two weeks. How much of your time do we need? And so when they sign up at the very beginning, we already know it's going to be 10% of your time on average for those two weeks, which is what? We'll call it roughly six to eight uh, or maybe five to eight good hours uh, over, those, over those two weeks, some number like that. So you, you give them a percentage, you give them a sense of the number of hours. They, they sit there and go like, yowzer, I don't have the, that many extra hours laying around doing nothing. Um, so then you have to have that discussion. What's going to get deprioritized then? Or should we yeah. share this project? That's a great recommendation. I think I'll do that because uh, these uh, thought leaders, you know, they seem really um, uh, uh, ready to commit and they're very gung-ho about uh, the whole effort in front of the CEO, yep. but uh, behind his back, right, he, um, he, they have other priorities that they focus on more. Yes. So I think if they could commit, like you said, 
a percentage in front of the CEO, then that's a commitment to everyone yeah. as well. And you, you, I mean, you may have to have a discussion. This, these are client people, I'm assuming, from your point of view, yes. right? Okay. Yes. Okay. You've got to have a discussion with them a little bit ahead of time. Uh, you know, part of this contract is uh, the the comp your company's got to provide a certain amount of people people time, and we think it's you and you and you, and you know, it's uh, it's this many hours for you, this many hours for you, this many hours for you, this many hours for you. What do you guys think? This is the way we see they were using you. This is the way we. You, know, you got to go to this meeting, you gotta participate in this kind of stuff. Uh, is there are other ways of getting some parts of that work? For example, somebody else that reports to that business stakeholder maybe could do some of that work. So it might be you know either above or below ten percent depending on who else is getting involved um, and how reliable that person is. But so anyway, you, you have to have these discussions up front, and then once you've kind of got basic agreement, then as you say, you got to have a somebody one level up saying, "Yep, that's what we want to happen." This needs to yeah, I made a recommendation to get a committed team and uh, they agreed to it. This is taking such a long time to interview and get all the right candidates. Yes. Um, but in the meantime, I need their commitment. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed, indeed. Um, okay, other ideas? Um, Mohammed, you've been, you've been quiet. Yes, uh, excuse me. Uh, you said that uh, you recommended a business stakeholder exist in the sprint planning meeting. Yes, um, first part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but, but uh, the product is, uh, product order is the uh, voice of customer. Uh, that's true too. They're the final decision maker about what the customer is going to get. But the business stakeholders are helping them. So my idea, you, I mean, not everybody's going to agree with it, Mohammed, but my idea is no one person knows everything. So we don't want to have one voice of the customer. We may have the ultimate decision maker about what's the voice going to be or what are the decisions going to be about it because we're going to disagree. Uh, even the customers, as you know, don't agree with each other. So we have multiple people giving their opinions and then the product owner has to decide. Um, and I want the business stakeholders to be there hearing it and to also voice what they think in terms of the individual stories. It's often divided up uh, as you, I don't know if you experience this, Mohammed, but I often do that, you know, we've got uh, these stories that are coming from this department, these stories that are coming from this department, these stories and, and the business stakeholder represent those four departments. Um, so they have to look at particularly at their own stories for their own department and go like, are they good to go? Do we have all the details? Uh, but in terms of the overall priority, definitely the product owner is there. Uh, one other question about, uh, uh, about the pool of uh, uh, backlog items okay. from the team. Yes. Uh, but the Scrum Master, uh, the product owner, he, he, he is a responsibility to prioritize the, the backlog items and uh, yes uh, ultimately yes he, he said i want this first uh, how to do the negotiation about this uh, oh issue so the first, yeah the, because the, the, the team uh, selects the easiest one no 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 the team has to select the first one off the top of the list and and then uh -huh. they ask themselves can we get one done and the answer is almost always yes then they take the next one can we get those two done then they take the next one. Can we get those three done? Presumably they're saying yes, yes, yes so far. They get to say when, they get to say at, at some point, no mas, we can't take any more. Or they can say, if you make us, if the next one has to be this one, we can't do it. Because as, uh, as Holly was, as Judy was saying, there's too many uh, impediments or whatever for that particular story. So uh, they get to go one by one in order though, Mohammed. So uh -huh. if they don't like one, then the product owner gets, has to say, okay, skip that one and go to the next one then, uh, which they would typically do in most cases in real life. But they, they, at least the product owner gets to argue about it and, and ask and try to understand, why can't you get this done? I thought we talked about it earlier, blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah, but, but, the, but the team uh, has to convince the product owner that it's, 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 really, it's really a big impediment or um, something like that i would not put it that way the team has the power to say no more mm -hmm. and the product owner gets to say well how about this how about that how about, how about if i divided the story and we skipped that part of it and did this other part so the product owner can offer alternate uh, solutions and see if they uh, can't buy into those but it's they have the power at least according to scrum to say no we can't do that story mm -hmm. the way it is the way it is we can't do it yeah. Um, so it's more the, their power than the product owner's power, yes. which, is, which is not always understood. People often think the product owner has the power to push the story. 
it's so we're i mean in simple terms it's a pull system not a push system but it's, it's a negotiation you know and the well, end, uh, they, they can negotiate a little yeah. bit but in this particular yeah. case they have the power the product owner is is you might say i go too far to call it begging but it's the product owner who's trying to see well what can we do then as opposed to them saying uh, okay we'll try or whatever they whatever they might say Mm. They have the they have the power to refuse. Yeah. Uh, now you know if they're going to refuse all the stories or you know way uh, commit way under commit to compared to what they could do, at some point uh, the partner of the management has to say, well, this we this team is not functional enough, is not productive enough. So yeah, yeah. so you know they're, they 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 there are constraints on their their ability to use their power, but they at least according to the Scrum rules have that power. And Thank you. So, so it, it feels a little bit different than what people th often think of as, as uh, that interaction, that meeting. Okay, uh, other questions about having a, a better sprint planning meeting. What else? What else? There's some basic things we didn't talk about, Judy. Obvious, basic, obvious things. Uh, what, Eric? What are the obvious things? Uh, start on time. Um, have having it, a clear objective or goals. Yes, making a good, well, do you mean sprint goal? Uh, is that you, Catherine? Yes. Yeah. Yes, and I added that later, and I, sh I kind of assume it. And I shouldn't have. I should have added it from the get go. Uh, running the meeting well as a scrum master, for, you know, facilitating it well, can make a big difference. Keeping them within the time boxes. Um, you know, making helping people appreciate the value of the meeting. Um, and then and keeping everybody engaged, Shelley. Right. Some of these people are not used to being engaged fully for four hours. Shelley goes, I can't stay engaged for four hours. Okay, so you got to figure out how to take breaks or body breaks or whatever it is, so they get refreshed and they come back and they're at, you know, they're not just sort of sitting there going like, yeah, I think I'm a, I think I'm alive. They're actually thinking while things are going, being said. Uh, and they're, uh, well, another key thing I think, DD, is they're all participating, right? Everybody's, I mean, they're not all participating exactly equally, but they're all participating verbally to some degree. Uh, you can see with the body language, but also just that they're all speaking, Shelley. She says, I'm not sure that all the people on my team can actually speak. I haven't seen it. Well, I'm joking. But some, sometimes you do have very quiet people on your team, right? Um, so I don't, I don't mean to uh, uh, tease so much as to actually really imply that they won't say anything at all for four hours. But you know what I mean. Yeah, and to add, that, add to that as well is not to have one person dominate the whole yes. sprint planning as well. Is that, that That's what happened with one of my last yes. clients. Yes, it's a very good point. Thank you for saying that. Uh, very good point. Because the so other if you, you Google the term technology mediated communication or technology mediated interaction, uh -huh. they have a lot of them are very dense scholastic articles, but there's a lot of information out there on how to improve, certainly in this environment that we're all operating in now, to improve those interactions when you're having to work on distributed teams. Yes. Um, and a lot of the tools available are very useful. I've seen them used successfully in educational environments yes. um, in keeping students engaged and involved. And those, those things certainly translate over to um, work environments for adults as well. Yes. Um, I don't know if you've used this tool, but um, uh, I like to use Mural. There's another one called Miro or Miro, whatever, uh, a, the, the Spanish artist. Um, and, and it allows everybody to be on the video, but also separately to be collaborating uh, simultaneously. And so, so it's not single threaded across whatever, uh, seven or 11 people, but it's multi-threaded. They're all moving things around at the same time. And these can be a little bitty sticky, so whatever, much like what we have physically, when we're physically co-located. Uh, and they can uh, you know, make it uh, much more interactive and mu also much quicker. But, uh, but maybe uh, in the context of our conversation right now, they're more engaged which is a big improvement. And, and the, the Zoom thing tends to make people disengage, I think. Um, at least it has a tendency to go, to go that way. So I like that one. There's, there's lots of others. Um, you know, Trello and, and a lot of these tools have things that enable everybody to see everything. The, the, to me, the, the additional advantage you want is not only can they see it, but they can also interact with multiple people at the same time. I think that's a quite 
um, uh, a useful feature of some of these that some of these tools have, and maybe others don't have so much. Um, okay, how are we doing? We're we're actually a little bit over. I've got to get going. In fact, I've got to go to a doctor's appointment, so I apologize for that. But anyway, I really enjoyed talking to you all. I will get this video of of this uh, up on YouTube. It may take me a day or two. Uh, I've got to uh, work with an associate. You already have the slide deck. Uh, or at least you have access to it. You got an email from me with a link to the slide deck. Um, but uh, give me your ideas about uh, what you'd like to see next, DD. If you don't mind, send me a quick little email. I'd like to see these three topics covered next, or soon anyway. Uh, and I'll be doing these um, probably two topics a month, um, pretty much every month. Okay, good to talk to you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Hope, hope all this hey, helps. Yeah. You have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.